Howdy, everybody. Welcome back to The Collective. I am Chance Burles, as you know, also known as Big Bird. Uh, we have Mr. Sean Taylor and Mr. Travis Bader with us today. They are going to start diving into the conversation right away. Uh, and I'm really excited to bring this to you guys. So we're going to let them take the the reins and start diving in on the previously uh, dictated question bank I have right now, which is understanding your tells. So now mm -hmm. recently, the reason why I brought this up is that actually uh, Sean told me at one point was me stroking my beard was one of my major tells in that. Uh, <laughs> it's when true. Play with the base of it. And I'm much more thoughtful, but when I start grabbing onto it, I'm like trying to get a point across or I'm being frustrated or something like that. So let's, let's talk about understanding your tells and how important that is so we'll let you guys give her let's start with sean what are you what are you going to say well let me build off of that and in respect to your tells since we're talking about you chance um one of your tells of course is this as you uh, illustrated but another one is this when you get all crazy with your hat yeah <laughs> when when you when you're lifting your hat and sweeping your head that's when it's level two tell. Mm. And so this is your first, the hat sweep is your second. And uh, mm. tells for anyone who is uh, listening to this right now, uh, if you've never seen Casino Royale, uh, the James Bond movie, uh, in that uh, movie, he talks about determining someone's tells. And uh, he's watching the villain of the week uh, directly across the poker table for him, looking for that tell. And uh, the tell of uh, the villain of the week was this. He'd put his finger up next to his eye and he'd do this. And as part of the movie, uh, I'm going to spoil it because everyone should have watched it by now. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the villain of the week uses the tell to throw James Bond off because he fakes with a tell because he knows the villain knows that he's being observed for his tell. And so the villain runs a counter program on the tell. So understanding your tells is great, but that's one layer of showing your tells to those around you and strategically or tactically, you can adjust your tells in order to, Mm, manipulate the situation, if you will. So there's an organic tell, and then there's a strategic or a tactical tell. Does that make sense? Totally yes, makes indeed. sense. What What are your thoughts on that, Trev? Well, it's funny that you delved right into uh, uh, misinformation, essentially, with a tell, because that was one of the things, as I was rushing over to the studio, 10 minutes, 15 minutes before getting here, I was at the hardware store picking up some plumbing stuff for a job I'm working on. And Chance is like, hey, you want to jump on this call? Um, thinking about tells, uh, it's a two way thing, of course. We've got verbal tells, we've got paraverbal tells, we've got nonverbal tells. So if we've got the ability to watch somebody and we can see them putting their hand up to their eye and we notice it's something that they do on a regular basis, that would be a nonverbal tell. A paraverbal tell might be, it's not necessarily what you say but how you say it. And of course your verbal tells are ticks. I've got some friends who will ask you to repeat yourself. Like you'll say something and they'll say, pardon. And you just wait a little bit. I won't say anything. And then they'll answer your question. You know, they've heard it, but they're looking for some time. They're trying mm -hmm. to buy a little, um, for a sort of, I guess a verbal and nonverbal tell. I love playing poker. And you watch somebody and they look at their hand and they're like, and they give this sort of exasperated sort of exhale and like, oh, my hands crap. You know, they got something good in their hands when they mm -hmm. do that. So what I usually do is when the cards are dealt, I'll just hold on to them and I'll watch everybody else pick up their cards and I'll see what they do when they pick it up, where their eyes go, what sort of uh, verbal, nonverbal tells that they give. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes people do pick up on that and you'll see them try and give a little bit of misdirection. Mm -hmm. As for my own tells, geez, Lord knows. I don't know. You guys would probably be better at pointing that out than myself because uh, sure it would. I, I figure I'm pretty much an open book and I'll just tell you straight out. If you want to know something, I just end up telling you. And if I don't want you to know, I'll just say, I'm not, I'm not interested in talking about that. 
Well, everyone <laughs> has talent. Everyone. Sure. And uh, it's just a matter of how much. And um, that that comes down to, I believe, the individual being aware of you're able to control your tells. And so if you've never really thought about your tells or, or the markers or the signals or the signs that you give off constantly, uh, if you're just not aware that that's happening, then you can't control them. And if you're not controlling them, then you can't work them to your advantage. And so uh, for anyone who's listening to this, tells are something that you need to understand by working on being better at it. And if you can't see them in yourself, then you need to start paying attention to all those around you. Now, I was lucky as a young guy, I spent a lot of time studying humans th humans through a 10 power scope or through a set of binoculars or, or really observing the world closely around me in order to look for the minutia, the giveaways, the tells of highly seasoned individuals or, or professionals that I was observing and looking for the the tiny little detail in some white noise of the moment and in order to see what's actually going on sometimes you have to look at something a long long time to form that trend and so in my opinion tells are a combination of experienced observation over a timeline that we will call a trend so with more experience and more trending in your life, you can start turning a timeline of tell observation from maybe 30 seconds to a split second. Nowadays, I feel like I get a pretty fast read on someone. Within 10 seconds, I know what a person's about, generally speaking. Just by, they don't even have to say a thing. I just have to look at them, understand their body language, get a feel, I'll call it, and then I start making my instant assessment. And that's, some people will say that I'm being judgy or being judgmental in that moment. I don't think so. I think that every second of our life, we should use the skills that we have, our experience, our trending abilities, our, our lifetime's worth of work to employ it in the real time against what's immediately in front of us. And it doesn't mean that as I look at someone, I'm trying to judge them and categorize them as, oh, he sucks, oh, he rocks. I'm just getting a read on them so that then I can enter into the moment in real time with them appropriately calibrated to what I have in front of me. So mm -hmm. if you're not working on tells always, why not? That's a good question. What do you think? Do you got any points on that, on anything to add on that, Trav? Well, I, I like the basis of, uh, of working on tells for the process of self-improvement, because if you're not self-aware enough of what your tells might be, if you're nervous, if you're frustrated, if you're angry, there's going to be a psychophysiological response associated with that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't recognize what that response is, it's very difficult for you to start the mental management process of working to get yourself to a more present or calm or uh, into a better place. So I, I really like that approach of looking for tells and others, obviously from an investigative standpoint or a profiling standpoint, it's really important to be able to quickly look at others and kind of get a sense at uh, what they're made of. The best predictor of future performance is gonna be past performance and you start building up a, a database in your mind of typical things that happen within people and the future performance that will come from that. Is a person going to be lying to me? Are they being forthright? Are they, uh, are they a good person? Generally the type of person that I want to interact with. And that's all a very important thing in, in looking at other people and their tells. Mm -hmm. Knowing your own tells is great for the poker table. But it's also really good for self-regulation. And I think that's kind of where, Sean, you're, you're taking this. And I, and I like that it's, approach. It was, a, it was exactly going to be my next point. Mm. And, and not, not that I have a point to make and not that your point isn't better than my point. It's just generally where I was heading. And the point, how I was going to illustrate that is through my own bad 
examples. So uh, using myself as the bad example or as an example of how I'm not doing it very well right now. So anyone who's watched me in live chats recently, um, since I started live chats, when I'm talking to the camera, you'll see my eyes moving around a fair bit. And, and it, perhaps it's because I'm thinking deeply. I don't know. Perhaps that's how I always have worked. I don't know, but I don't think so. Because I've seen myself in the past talk to people and my eyes don't move around quite as much prior to live chats. But what I find myself doing now is, uh, as I'm even as I'm speaking, I'm, I'm watching myself and I'm watching you guys. And, and I'm trying in real time to synchronize my body language or what I'm reflecting out to the camera with how I am trying to put a message across or how I am currently breathing in the moment. And so it's something that I've never had to do before. I mean, I, organically in the past when I'm talking to crowds or talking to a person or whatever the case is, interacting with other humans, I've done my thing without looking in a mirror. I've just been me projecting, you know, whatever I'm projecting. But I've, I've never been a guy who stood in front of a mirror a lot. I don't pay attention to myself in a mirror so much. So I've never formally watched myself talk in front of a mirror. And I suspect that's maybe what someone would pay several thousand dollars for to go to an acting class or, or whatever the case is in order to be more comfortable in front of a camera and how you're supposed to portray yourself in front of a camera and how you're supposed to synchronize your outward reflection of what you're trying to represent in the moment and synchronize it with your inner feelings. But I've never taken that course. <laughs> My course was like, bungee cording a phone onto a tree out in the bush when I was riding my bike when I first started live chats. I was just looking at a camera. I've never looked at a mirror and talked. And so <laughs> now this is, a, this is it that the eye of Sauron. <laughs> now this is a new phenomenon for me where I can see myself as I talk, but I'm trying to reflect off what I'm trying to say, what I'm seeing in myself and what I'm getting from people who I'm interacting with. So my eyes are moving around a lot as I educate myself as to how to synchronize my visual output with my inner dialogue, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, here, let me ask you this question real before we, uh, uh, do, do you have a point on that, Trav, or did you want to? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, before jump you on jump here. into the question, yeah, I was going to say it's in, interesting. Dude, we could talk, talk about this all day long, and then easily. you know, and then another day we can talk about something else. So, but whatever. <laughs> let's 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 Give see her. where it goes. Yeah. Well, the shifty eye things. You know, people say, "Well, that person looks shifty," and it's actually one of the smaller uh, tells that people will look for is if the eyes are shifting back and forth. Is this person trying to be deceptive? Alan mm. Pease and actually his wife as well have written books on uh, how I think they had how to read a person like a book or understanding body language. They've got a number of different books on that. And one of the things that they try to reinforce is, well, just because Sean's eyes are going back and forth doesn't necessarily mean that one little indicator means that person is going to be shifting. And what you should be looking for is uh, clusters, tell clusters. So some of these things are going to be micro and some are going to be macro, whether it's up there touching the eye and it's a, a, quite an overt thing that you see, or maybe it's a little blink or a flinch or a, um, um, I know when I get tired, I'll, uh, kind of roll my eyes when I blink and my, my wife says it looks like a lizard blinking or something like this, but <laughs> let's um, not rule it out. Let's not rule it out. Um, uh, Gavin DeBecker wrote a book called the gift of fear and Aside from it being a very good sales book for his business, and I think he does pretty high end work in the in the U.S. with government, three letter government agencies, uh, the crux of it essentially was being able to trust your gut. Men have a gut feeling, women have women's intuition, and when you start looking at these um, tells, let's say, some of it will go down to gut feeling, and it really will. And then you try and rationalize that and say. Well, their eyes are shifty. They must be shifty. Well, maybe not. Their toes are pointing at me in a group of people standing together. Maybe they're more, more interested in talking to me than they are to the rest of the group. Maybe, maybe not. We look at, we look at the cumulative, uh, cluster of different tells that a person might be approaching or presenting, but 
the fact that we have this deep seated intuition in us, I don't think should be discounted. If you get this feeling like, ah, you know what? I think this person is being deceptive to me. I can't nail it down. Their eyes aren't shifty. They're not doing the things. They're not using uh, a lack of contractions in their speech or, or other little tells that are out there. But my gut says they're being deceptive. I would say start leaning on your gut and don't try and you can, you have all the time in the world afterwards to analyze why your gut may have been right or may have been wrong. But if your gut says something in the moment, I would, I would use that as a, uh, your initial baseline to go off of. That's a great point. I agree. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> there's actually, it reminds me of something when we were doing, uh, this is specific to minefield stuff, but <clears throat> was that we got told very early was if there's doubt, there is no doubt. Mm. And what they were talking about was like, if you suspect you're in a minefield, treat it as such. It doesn't yes. mean that, you know, you, you are in a minefield, just need, you need to treat it that way. And you need to do your drills accordingly. But I always, I've held that, I've held on to that. And if I gut says, hey, this is not cool, I'm out. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's that simple. Right. Um, well, speaking on gut, yeah. since you raised the subject, um, the idea being that how much do you trust your gut? So let me throw something at you. You, you can't trust your gut until you start trusting your gut. Mm -hmm. And the only way to trust it is to actively pursue the idea of how much gut instinct do I have and how much gut instinct can I create? So let's pretend for a moment I was like, a 17 year old teenager thinking about joining the military. My gut at that point had been developed by all of the years that I'd spent in the bush hunting squirrels and rabbits and goony birds and whatever. Mm. And it had been, it had been built by walking down a frozen or, or, or an ice cold uh, stream or crick out in the middle of nowhere in my jeans, fishing for rainbow trout spending hours walking down a small creek and and knowing and having fished so much that I know where I need to throw my my spinner or I need to throw it here there or anywhere I know the lay of the land I know how to fish I have all the skills I've got countless hours of doing it but at some point skill set starts translating into gut set if you understand that you're not born with it and it's a hundred percent. It's like any skill you have to pursue excellence within your instinct. So at some point in my young life, I stopped fishing a Creek or a stream based on tactical and strategic understandings. I started fishing that Creek with my gut mm. feeling, feeling the Creek, feeling the fish, trying to feel what was the next second or two of the future on how I would play that creek based on my gut. So as a young, we'll call it teenager, before I joined the military, I was already working on my gut instinct, but I wasn't thinking of it as a gut instinct. I was just thinking of how to do things better. But then in the military, unlike the fish that you can't see or the rabbits that you don't see as often, now I was surrounded by hundreds of men where I got to observe them under arduous conditions, adverse conditions, under challenging and stressful conditions. And so I, I, I had like a, a laboratory in front of me, almost like a rat maze that I got to study every day and understand how human beings tick intellectually, physically, emotionally, mentally, but probably most important of all for me, working on my gut, understanding the instances that were surrounding me in the real time. And so over a period of years, I started to rely way less on my skills and I started to rely way more on my feeling of mm -hmm. the moment. And as you, as you do it more and more, this is my point, as you do it more and more and you understand that it's a real thing, call it a sixth sense or whatever you want to call it, the more you engage in it, the better you get at it. And then it starts reinforcing yourself. Then you can start trusting it. But 
it doesn't happen while you're sleeping. It happens while you're actively engaging in it. So you have to hunt it. You have to chase it like a skill set until it just becomes a part of you. Mm -hmm. If you've been scammed, if you've been in a fight, if you've, or talked to others who have been in these sort of situations, more often than not, I find people say, oh man, I should have seen it coming. I should have seen it coming because of A, B, C, or D. So if you can, after the fact, analyze and find A, B, C, and D, the tells, the different reasons why you should have seen this coming, that means they're present in the time as well. Perhaps your mind isn't processing it as fast, but I do find your gut will. It's kind of like walking into a bar and you get this weird gut feeling and it's like, you know, this isn't safe, right? Maybe you casually saw a bunch of motorcycles parked outside. Maybe there's a bunch of full patch members on the inside, but you know, I'm a big guy and I'm tough and I can take care of myself. But my gut says, you know, just leave. But then the male ego gets involved and like, oh, geez, starts trying to rationalize and go through this thing. I say, if your gut says something, just listen to it, go for it. It's so much easier to have made a mistake in your gut and been safe than it is to try and rationalize your way through when your gut told you you shouldn't be there to begin with and find yourself in a difficult spot. Well, I agree, but you know what? As young men, we have to make those mistakes as well you in do. order to reinforce those lessons. You know, there's, I I feel a room before I step into it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've, I've already, I already know what's going on within a split second of walking through a door. Yep. I, I don't even have to look to my left and right arcs. I just yep. know. And I don't question myself. It's just like, it's like another sense. It's a sixth sense. And so it, I've, I've just done it enough that I don't even question it. It's like having good vision or good hearing, or it's just another sense. If you work on it long enough as a skill set and start trusting it and believing in it. But as a, as a young man, you got to make those mistakes. You got to be walking into that bar and thinking, man, this just doesn't, something feels off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then you just walk through that door anyway, because, you know, you're curious as what's going on. Mm. And, and even as you know, it's all wrong. Your eyes and your ears aren't picking up on why it's wrong. But you just walk right up to that bar, bar and order that shot of whiskey, put your elbow on the bar and think like everything's going to be okay. But it isn't because your mm. gut lets you know that it isn't. But you got to learn that lesson. You know, the last in-person uh, course that was held just prior to COVID at the uh, TTC, Tactical Training Center in Vancouver, uh, was a use of force expert symposium. So I was in there as a student and doing the use of force expert thing because I do consulting with different law firms. But one of the presenters they had up was talking about uh, your different senses and which ones are the fastest. And apparently smell is the fastest synapses that, that hits through the brain prior to touch, prior to sight, prior to any of your, prior to listening to something, it's smell is the first one that comes in. And they're talking about how fear can have a smell and how uh, people will walk into a situation and their brain's tweaking and they don't understand why. And it could just be a similar smell, similar situation. I thought that was kind of interesting. I think that's, I think that's correct because I've experienced it. And, and there's actually two aspects to just, we'll just, I'll just talk about smell for a sec as a sense and how rapid you can get a read on a situation. So using the bar as an example, I can walk into a place that has uh, that certain, um, uh, it, there's a certain weight to the air. It has a certain heft to it. And I, I can interpret it through my nose, but I feel the heft more so than I smell a smell, if that mm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. But to my point, um, it's there's a short-term sort of understanding through the nose, but then there's a long, long-distance understanding. So there's many a time that I've been hunting someone, and, and, and I can smell them long before I see them or hear them. Mm -hmm. I can smell the freshness on them. Usually it's been because I've been living out there for long enough that I smell like dirt, and mm -hmm. they smell like soap. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's funny. If you haven't eaten, I find for myself for a couple of days, two, three days, you know, everyone will talk about 
people that smell and they say, well, you know, different cultures will have a different smell that goes with them. And Caucasians, we stink. Like I'd walk into the office, <laughs> I walk into the office and it's like a, it's like a, a salty pork, like kind of a, I, I don't know how to describe it, but smell. And you can, people would walk in the door and bang, you can smell it right away. My uh, boys. Your boys. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when, once they start, once once they get up in the guest room with uh, get some video gaming going, and they don't play a lot of video games because they're busy as you know mm. human beings. But uh, when they get after it in the room and the doors close a little bit, man, I walk in there, it's like being punched in the face. And it's not so much the the smell; they're mm. they're smelling like teenagers, but uh, it's the heft. Mm -hmm. It's there's a certain weight. As soon as I open the door, it's like bam, right in the face, and then I get the smell. Mm. It's like you know, a musk, the video gaming musk. musk. <laughs> it's, it's what it is. Formidable. It's it's not a smell. It's a weight. It's like mm -hmm. when you walk from a um, a dry air conditioned or a dry desert air, and then you step out into a storm. Mm -hmm. There's there's it's not the humidity in the air. There's a weight to the air. And when I'm walking into a clear space, like a, let's say I'm walking into a bar. And and it's a lighter feel in the air. It's way less threatening than that heavier feeling in the air. Hard to explain, but it's just a thing. You know, I, I don't want to take this on too far of a tangent, but uh, Sean, oh, you're please you were, do. You were talking about. Oh, you're gonna like this. So you're talking about fishing, and how you'd fish off a of gut. And I will hunt, and I'll fish in a very similar way. I just, you know, this, this area doesn't feel productive. I'm moving or this area feels productive. Why? And I'm trying to wrap my head around the reason why, but I'll just trust my gut. Nikki Van Schindel, she was a, a contestant on the show alone and where they sit you out into the woods and they leave you alone for a long time. And I think it was 51 days, if memory serves me correct, that she was on there before she was medically RTU'd and, uh, she was in a bit of shock for that, but, uh, because she felt fine, but she talks about, uh, interacting with wildlife in a similar way to how we're talking about interacting with people and that she would, uh, basically settle herself to a point where the little brown birds weren't alerting, uh, chirping off anymore. The squirrels weren't alarming anymore, uh, where she could get within distance and just touch deer, which I've done on some of the coastal islands here, but they're like, they're like dogs over there, like pets. Yeah. Um, so Sean, when you talk about fishing by gut, if we are to be looking at the tells and the senses and everything else that we're taking in from around us, and we're going to make changes to ourselves and our behavior off of what we see, um, I guess it's reasonable to assume that those around us are also doing the same. And I wonder if you and I are more productive fishing by gut or hunting by gut, because we're giving off a different energy, which is now more conducive to being able to harvest an animal or catch that fish or interact with that individual, uh, or if we are just solely picking up, like, are we creating our own destiny, which probably to a point we are, or are we just picking up on, uh, things around us and, uh, moving to, towards that? Well, I'd like to go a little bit deeper. I knew you so, would. So, so <clears throat> I, I, when I was young, I, I didn't have this figured out. I, I was just, we'll, we'll call it, I was instinctually doing whatever I was doing. It wasn't deeply thought out. I just wasn't wise enough. I, no one was telling me, giving me wisdom. So, uh, but at the time, what I was doing was trying to use my gut to feel what was going on around me. And sometimes like some of my friends of my age in, in high school, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I just stepped out of a creek. My buddy was, uh, two of my buddies were just up uh, stream a little bit. I'd stepped out. And uh, as the moment I stepped out of the creek and, and uh, maybe 10 feet off the bank, um, something felt wrong. And, uh, and so I just kind of started looking around, sort of a 360 scan to just try to understand why I was feeling what I was feeling. And none of it made sense. So... I just followed my instinct and I walked about maybe 10, 15 meters uh, upstream a little bit. And sure enough, right at my feet was a beaver that had been all torn up. And that didn't make any sense to me why the the beaver was torn up because 
you know, it's it's not like a wolf got it or a coyote got it or whatever. It, it it there was something else that was going on in that scene as I approached it. It felt like it was a more it was a different kind of occurrence. And so as I squatted down and I was pretty handy as a young bushman. I squatted down and looked at this beaver. Didn't didn't pollute the uh, the scene, so I could get a good read on it. I was tracking the footprints and started following the footprints, and sure enough, it was a wolverine. And uh, at the time uh, where I lived in Grand Cache, uh, up in the Rockies of Alberta, um, you know, wolverines were around, but you know, they're not a common animal. They're 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 a unique animal for sure, and they're not a daily occurrence. And uh, they try to be a little invisible to some degree. And so this was a fresh kill. And those were fresh tracks. And I had the feeling that not only was I seeing something that had just happened, but I had the feeling that I was being watched as I was looking at the fresh kill. And so was I being watched by Wolverine? Who knows? But that's what I felt. And when... When I stepped out of that river, I, I, I operated in two different environments, but I was still doing the same thing. As I was walking down that river um, fishing, I was trying to feel the river. I was, tr I know it sounds goofy, but I was trying to flow like water, even though I didn't know the phrase at the time. I was trying to be the water so as not to disturb anything around me. So that I could really exist in the moment as as a real time instinctual feeling, and and just not try to be me, just try to be it all around me. And then when I stepped out on the bank on dry land, hard land, not water now, I was still doing the same thing, but they were in two completely different environments. One was a bar, the other one was a car salesman lot or whatever. Call it what you want. Two extremely different environments but the same instinct was giving me a read on the two different environments. I just didn't know how to use it at the time. Mm. I find when looking for animals, when I reach a point where I'm sort of moving like the animal or operating like the animal, I, I tend to find way more. Like if I just come out of the city and I'm in the bush and the car has been going and I still got all the, all the stuff going on in my head, you don't see nearly as much. The second I'm uh, slowing down, maybe I'm thirsty, I'm drinking out of the river, I'm acting and moving slowly, uh, and you feel more in tune with the environment, and all of a sudden the animals come out and they start presenting themselves to you. And I remember, no, you guys have a military background, aside from cadets as a youngster, that was mine. Um, but we'd do patrolling and we'd get all cammed up and I'd love doing that sure. different exercises. And I'd be hiding in the bush and people would walk by. And I learned that if I made eye contact with people, even if I'm completely cammed up and I'm hidden away, but I made eye contact with people as they walked on by more often than not, I found they'd look straight down at me and they might not really like, they'd just lock eyes with me in a, in a weird way. So I started looking beside people and using my periphery as they walked by and I found it didn't happen. I don't know if you Always. guys ever experienced that. Have you experienced 100%, that? hundred percent. In fact, okay. uh, I know when someone's looking at me, right. I can feel it. Right. And, and I can feel someone behind me looking sure. at me and the classic exam where I learned to strongly believe this. It was actually on my Pathfinder course. We'd just come out of SEER, S-E-R-E, and uh, we'd escaped and evaded, and uh, I'm not going to go into a long song and dance about the story, but I was being hunted by a, a whole pile of two commando guys, and, uh, and, and I was in the bush, hunkered down, and, and watching someone walk three feet past me, and, and I was invisible to them, because I was dirt. Mm. I was in my mind, I was soil. Mm. And as they walk by, I'd watch their trajectory knowing that they were going to be walking right next to me. And as they came up on me, I just simply looked down at the branch mm -hmm. on the trail because I didn't want to put eyes on the objective that closely that they felt me. And the mm. moment that they went just a touch past me, I launched on that guy, kicked him out, dragged him down, hand over the mouth and nose, 
uh, had a knife, put it to his neck and said, this is what's going to happen next. And mm -hmm. so I, I feel that if I would have been eyeballing him as he was coming up on me and walking uh, directly next to me, he would have felt it. But even if he hadn't have, why take the chance? Why, mm -hmm. why, why even look at that guy when I don't need to look at that guy? I can just look down next to his feet or to the branch or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Um, it's actually in when you're dealing with horses and you're training horses, one you never look them in the eye. Mm -hmm. You always you always look at the shoulders or you always look at the neck or something like you just look away because a first off, we're predators, right? So we're naturally we're some of us are <laughs> we're we're inclined <laughs> to eye like eyes on and watch something intently and you can like hunt that way. But Horses understand this in that when they're out in the wild and they have a, a cougar or something like that that's been tracking them, that cougar doesn't take their eyes off of that horse. And the horse can feel it. And as soon as they feel that there's eyes on them, they get nervous and they start moving around. They start getting the herd together, getting ready to run. So it's not only is it a, uh, you know, it's a might be a personal thing, but it is a absolutely natural thing that happens is when you put eyes on something that, that, that they know about it mm -hmm. except when it's a human who's never considered it except when it's a human who is so disconnected from the world around them either through video gaming or whatever if they're that disconnected right. they will never ever feel that gaze on them they in fact they won't believe it's a thing They'll call it ha Harry Potter magic or whatever. It sure. doesn't exist. What are you talking about? Are you crazy? But that's just because they're the crazy person in this conversation, not exploring a full life, in my opinion. Back to the hunting side. I remember an older European hunter talking about giving advice. He says, when you're going through the woods, don't think I'm looking for an animal. I'm going to shoot it. I want to find that animal. And you he says, think happy thoughts when you're out there. You're just enjoying, you're one with the nature and an animal will present itself and you can make that decision. And it was kind of a, a funny thing at the time when the, when the person said it, but there is that layer of truth to what he's saying, I believe. I believe it's the key to life, whether mm -hmm. you're hunting or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually I have a, I have a couple of great stories about that. I'll do them quick, but, uh, and then we'll move on to the next point was the fact that uh, my first, first time I got an elk. I had actually given up for the night and the whole day I was searching for it the whole day. And I was like wandering around. I'm just like, where are these friggin' animals? And I'm sitting on top yes. of the hill and I'm scanning. And then I had, give, I was like, you know what? It's almost, I got about, you know, 45 minutes left of light. I'm just going to go back to camp. I'm going to give up for the day. No big deal. Got back to my camp. I was laying in my cot in my sleeping bag with my headlamp on and my book up. And I was reading two feet in front of me and I could just hear all these hoof beats just off to the side of me I was like what <laughs> is that and there, there are cattle in that area so i was just like freaking cows running through my uh running through my campsite and i look up and there's like a group of 50 elk just rolling through my campsite and they were maybe maybe 70 meters away from me and i was like mm -hmm. okay it's on now and i jumped out in my underwear and i got my rifle out and I loaded i was able to get one just before last light but it's so true when you when you stop hunting and you just start enjoying being out there and like looking at animals and i have i've had more success hunting uh when i stop hunting mm -hmm. so yeah because you were living in the future mm -hmm. that's it that's exactly it so let's uh let's move on from tells because we've kind of pushed into something else here but this leads into it actually, which is quite interesting too, is that once you understand your tells, I think that you can be a more authentic communicator, right? Because once you know what your body does uh, without you thinking about it, once you actually start recognizing and thinking about it, you can be much more authentic in your conversations with other people because you know how you, you know how you're going to react to things and you can kind of manage those. Any thoughts on that from either of you? Yeah. Yeah, I've got thoughts. I, I think if you're, uh, I think authenticity comes from being authentic. And 
<laughs> really, you, you just, if you want to be seen as being honest, be honest, right? Um, I think if somebody works too hard at trying to sell the idea that they are honest or sell the idea of whatever it is that they're trying to get across, that's when I naturally start backing up. Why are they trying to sell me hard on something? And from experience, I found uh, people who are going to be dishonest to you are the ones that are going to try the hardest to get you to believe whatever narrative it is that they're selling. And the harder that they work at it, the more I will start to back away. So if I'm trying to work really hard at my verbal and nonverbal and all the rest, <clears throat> and so that I can be seen as being authentic, I, for me, I find it'll have a counterintuitive approach. But if I approach it as I am being authentic, I really don't care what you think or not, if you trust me or not, if you believe me or not, because what I'm saying is what I know to be true, uh, that comes across a lot better. I agree. It's it's a, the difference between an authentic, organic experience versus a contrived, authentic experience. And um, I mean, I'm, I try to do it better every year. I try to be more authentic every year. And, you know, all of the goofy cliches out there of just be present, just breathe, just be you, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> they're they're kind of true. But it's just that they they are so they they feel so live laugh love or so lightweight sort of advice that I write them off in a sense of whatever that's not how, how can it be that simple mm -hmm. but it is that simple you, you just got to breathe exist do your best and the rest takes care of itself and the the person on the other end that that you're talking to the receiving party. Um, it's for them to take away what they want to take away from the conversation. I, I'm trying to shape the moment to some degree, but not inauthentically. I'll do my best to take a conversation in a direction that I think will be helpful as a win-win for both parties. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell out to move the needle one direction or the other if if it leads to an inauthentic. Uh, moment for me. That's a great point. And actually, um, we have a, we have our first question. Oh. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it in here, just so you guys can see it. What does authenticity mean to each one of you? So let's start with Sean because I got you up here. What sure. does authenticity mean to you? Well, what it means to me nowadays is different than what it used to mean to me back in the day. So when I was young, uh, hard charging, and all of that good stuff, I thought. I, I looked at authenticness differently than I do now. And I uh, think to me, in, in my current version of uh, older Sean, um, it's, it's uh, f I'm not trying to put on airs. I'm not trying to represent something I'm not, which of course is what authenticity is. But when I was younger, I tried harder to represent what I thought I was. But nowadays, I know I don't need to do that. I just got to be me. Neither a person digs it or they don't. But I'm not going to create a false persona to encourage someone to like me. And I'm also not going to stick to who I am authentically and rub it in someone's face to make them dislike me more. I'm just going to be me. And, and if someone warms up to me or not, I hope they do. I hope we get along. I hope it's cool like Fonzie. But I'm, I'm just not going to sell out to encourage someone to like me. And that's kind of how I've run my social media um, to, to date, is I don't try to represent something I'm not. I don't try to gain friends or likes or clicks. I just do me. And, and I'm doing my best. I'm, I'm trying hard to engage with people, but I'm not going to engage with people in a way that isn't genuine. And actually, I just spoke about that a little bit this morning as part, I did a part one and a part two with uh, Seb Lavoie this morning, live chats on my IG page, I'm not trying to pimp my IG page out. In <laughs> fact, my IG page is trying to pimp people over to the collective. But um, when I was speaking, before I spoke with uh, Seb, I, my dialogue prior to him joining me was about 
how um, there's three characters on Instagram right now. I see them pop up as Instagram ads. Uh, I don't need to mention their names because I don't want to give them any reverse credit because they suck. Uh, these guys run Instagram ads and they're so fake. And and it's these classic examples. Uh, the ads are like uh, it'll it'll show a special operations soldier jumping out of the back of a CC-130 all looking sexy and rad, or it'll be a sniper in a ghillie suit doing that thing. And, and they're sexy photos that attract a certain uh, demographic, typically young men. And, and these clowns, these three clowns that I keep seeing the Instagram ads from, who I won't block or report, because I use them as fuel, to, as, as the precise opposite of what human beings should do. <laughs> these clowns are selling they're telling a lie that I've looked at them deeply enough that I understand all three of them have no background to stand on. It's all fakery. And it's that classic case of join our program now and we'll teach you how to improve by 476% your sniping skills. Dude, you are a half marathon coach. You're a freaking clown. And never served, never been in the dirt, never, not even a shred of connection to what they're pitching out there on Instagram as uh, as being Radmaster 9000s. They never were. They never will be. But when you look at it as an ad, as a young man, when I was a young man, I would have seen an ad like that and thought, oh, cool, another resource. I've got to figure out how mm. to use this, et cetera. They're, they're pied pipering a young generation off the edge of the cliff based on a false set of goods by clowns. And so what does authenticity mean to me? Nowadays, it means looking at a guy and thinking, how legit is this guy? And then does his legitness match up with his authentic message that he's putting out to me? Because you can be a badass but if your message is like double badass, I'm not interested. Mm. But I'll listen to a badass deliver badassery, just not double badassery. <laughs> I love it. What are what are your thoughts on uh, authenticity? what is authenticity? What does it mean to you? Well, you know, it's funny because we're talking about just be yourself, right? That's the that's the tried and truism that people put out there. Just be yourself. But so many people have a difficult time saying, well, what is myself? And myself changes, right? Like maybe myself in the morning is going to be different prior to having a cup of coffee than after having a cup of coffee. Maybe myself when I'm tired and hungry is going to be different or if I'm under pressure. So maybe it's easier rather than saying what is myself is to like, Sean alluded to earlier when he looks at other people that he still keeps on the follow list as an example of what not to be, what am I not? And so if you can start quickly pulling away all the things that you know that you aren't, it gets you closer to what is yourself from an authentic process. And I find that in being authentic, the easiest way for me to do that is just to verbalize my process as I'm working through. In this situation, in this moment, here's what I'm thinking. But there's a caveat with that, which you have to be very careful that you don't set yourself up for failure by oversharing or giving too much information to, let's say, the other side. So I would say if you want to work on yourself being authentic, start culling what you aren't out of your life. And if you see others around you that imbue those traits that aren't you or that don't allow you to be how you feel to be authentic, start culling those out of your life as well. So that when you come to the point where you want to be able to verbalize your way through, through something, here's what I think and why, you know, it's not going to be hopefully used against you because those that you're surrounding yourself with are those who are going to bring you up as opposed to try and use these things against you. I don't know if that's uh, really the most concise way, but the authenticity <laughs> is something that will, will change. The you is a very difficult thing to describe, yeah. but the you not. I think it was a great way. I, th I mm -hmm. think that's a great way to do it for anyone who hasn't considered how to be more authentic. 
Trav, I think that that is like the gold star of the day because uh, it gives someone a tool. They, now, now they have an ability to, if they don't know how to do any of it, now they've got a tool. Start stripping out what you're not. Start mm -hmm. figuring out what you're not. Uh, start And then start figuring out who around you you want to be. Now you've got two tools mm -hmm. uh, rather than random guesswork. Because, I mean, as a young man, no one was having these conversations when I was a young man. Mm. No, no one ever had these con kind of conversations. No one ever mentioned just randomly a couple of tools to start stripping away the nonsense. I mean, you just never heard it. But in a in a in a two minute period of time, now there's two tools that someone can become more authentic. Which, by the way. You know, you have to pay $4,000 to go on an authenticity course and get a <laughs> certificate from Sigma International. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, those courses could be helpful, too. No, I'm just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny, though, as you guys were talking, uh, I was been thinking about authenticity and stuff. And is that for me, at least what it always came down to was what felt right. Right. Anything that I did that I was not being authentic about. I had to work at, as you were saying earlier, uh, Trav, was that like, I, I have to either make myself believe it or I have to work kind of extra hard for it to feel kind of right, but it never felt true. Mm. And so like when I work with horses, that feels right. Mm. What, whether I know a lot or not, it doesn't matter. It's just like, it feels right. When I work with other veterans, it feels right. When I do the podcast, and I get to talk to people that feels natural and it flows really well and I, I and i learn and i grow with it um and for me that's what to be authentic doesn't it's not a question of skill set or how good you are at something or talent or whatever it's that it's it feels right just feels right as so hang on a sec okay because this is kind of important and anyone who's listening to this right now it's actually a dangerous moment I call it, I'll call this an inflection point because there's a difference between it feels right when you're rightly calibrated Good and point. it feels right when you're losing your freaking mind. Mm -hmm. And so let's pretend for a moment that you're in the deep, dark despair of mm, whatever. Times are so bad that you don't actually have good rightness clarity because Great the point. world around you the way that you're seeing it is not the way the world is. It's because you don't have it right in your head. And so if you're not right in your head and you're relying on what feels right, well, now you're not doing the right things. And so it's not that you're wrong, Chance, because you should rely on what feels right in conjunction or in parallel with you being in contact or maybe surrounded by or at least in touch with people who are doing it right mm -hmm. who are feeling the world the right way who understand how to do it better and their right might look different than your right and so you've got to have that yardstick your external sense of what's right as well as your own internal sense of right i hope that makes sense yeah, absolutely. And having a having a correct baseline is 100% true. And you're um, being able to see what is right based on that baseline, on the proper baseline. Because again, if you're in a depth of a depressive episode, what feels right in that moment is not what is actually right. <laughs> so you're That's right. And so, and, so, and so anyone who's listening to this right now, and they're um, they're thinking like, what do you mean baseline? Well, that's an entirely different conversation, but it's an important starting point to understand who you are right now, and more importantly, how you're going to build off of that. So establishing a baseline is good, but maybe depending on how rough you are, if you're deep, deep down into the darkness, establishing a baseline in isolation using your own little peanut is not the right approach. You need to kind of bounce some of those ideas off at the external world around you 
and and see what kind of feedback you get from the external world. So establishing a baseline is good internally, but you really need to run checks and balances against that on the external world. And this is something that I see in social media. It peaked. I don't see it as much now, but it peaked at the peak of the lockdown period where, you know, large chunks of the world were getting all kinds of crazy, saying all kinds of crazy things on their social media feeds, like literally lunacy. And, and it's because they were so wrapped up in their own internal world. They weren't calibrating against the external world and their internal world was their entire universe. And the things that they were saying made sense to them as if that's how the world should run. Mm. But the world doesn't run based on what your internal dialogue tells you. There's a world wrapped around you that you have to connect with in order to better understand how to set a proper baseline. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And you know what? If you need help setting a baseline, visit the-collective.ca. This will help you set your baseline because all the information is going to be collated there or congregated there i mean that's what the whole process of the collective is about is for all of us to get better and in order to get better you have to have you got to know where your baseline is that's the, the if you don't know where you are or if you're lost in the woods you got to know where you are before you can go anywhere else well you gotta and you gotta bump into cool people mm -hmm. i mean in, in my opinion the collective is uh you know there'll be information there and you can learn build grow and all of that good stuff but most important to me is when I started thinking about the when we started talking about this, I just wanted to have a cool place to hang out with cool people. I want to be cool like Fonzie, man. And, <laughs> and so, you know, that's more important to me than, than learning things. What's, what's most important to me is learning people, learning cool people, because I, I'll, I'll grow more as a human being by spending 10 seconds sitting next to a cool dude versus one hour of a PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that I get to hang out with someone who's freaking awesome for 10 seconds, even if it's virtual, I grow way more by knowing that there's more awesome in the world. PowerPoint presentations, they're a dime a dozen and lectures are a dime a dozen and teaching people stuff is a dime a dozen. Being around freaking rad people, now that's something that's hard to find. I think that's a really good takeaway for anyone who's uh, watching and listening to this. And you're talking about calibrating yourself and finding a baseline. When things are good and they're going well for you, that's the best time for you to start oh, yeah. really calibrating. And if you set those people up around you, those really cool people to you, you hang around those people who you would aspire to be like or who you admire, when things aren't going well, they're the ones who can help recalibrate you back to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. I am. hundred percent. The, um, what is the, the old adage of you are the sum of the, your five friends you spend the most time around it's with. So true. Show me your friends. I'll show you who you are. Yeah. 100%. It is true. But you know, the, uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to add a waiver to that in, and it's, you know, some of five friends, seven friends, six friends, nine and a half friends, whatever. Um, it's, it's kind of true. It's, it's a good yardstick, but I, let me throw this at you. I feel that as legit as it is, it's now turning into a, an anachronism. In what way? In the sense of 10 years ago, it would have been more relevant, but who are my friends now? They're virtual friends. And so my virtual friends and at the pace of technology now, I'm, I'm, my friends are now a hundred friends, not five or seven friends. Mm -hmm. And, and the pace of communication, at least how I'm communicating nowadays, it's rapid. And so if I talk to a hundred guys in a day, uh, through either quick blips or long terms, it doesn't matter how long or intense it is. I'm communicating with a lot of people and to some degree, and I'm not going to say they're all super tight friends, they scale on a scale of one to 10. But in communicating with all of them, I don't look at the other person as that guy's a loser, but I'm going to invest a lot of time into him. I consider them as possibly a friend. So I invest, I give them my best effort. I invest into them. 
And so nowadays, this is just my opinion, but I believe I'm a sum of the effort I make into a hundred virtual friends. Mm. And so some of them only have a blip in my life and some of them have a freaking pillar in my life, but all of them shape me rapidly more than just five or seven friends. Cause let's face it. I mean, we've all got friends on the sidewalk. I've got friends in my town and you know, we all nod and smile and have a catch up and whatever, but I connect deeper with people on the internet nowadays than I do with friends in town, if that makes sense. So if we were to update that anachronism, would it be show me what you turn your attention to and what you allow into your life and I'll show you who you are? I think that that's true for me, but, but, is it, but is it true for you guys? I don't know. You know, people talk about social media and they say how negative social media is. Well, I guess it depends what the algorithm is going to be feeding you, what you typically like to look at. Because it can be very positive as well. Like this is on social media. And I think we're yep. bringing some positivity out to the world. So, I, yeah. I, what is it that you are accepting into your life? And sometimes that's going to be a mirror. Your social media will be a mirror of kind of where your head's at and what you're looking at. Because you keep seeing things that reaffirm what it is you think. Whether it's political or scientific views or whatever it might be. Show me what you turn your attention to and what you allow into your life. Yeah, I'd say that's probably a pretty accurate description yeah. of. I, I couldn't agree more, actually. And I was actually going to say the exact same thing, Travis. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> there you're, you go. Uh, well, and the thing is, I have buddies, I'm sure we all do, that uh, you know, they say that same thing is that social media is toxic and it's all bad and it's always negative. And, so, and I say that to them, I say, well, then that's because what you're looking at, mm -hmm. right? Like my feed is full of positivity and, you know, inspiration and lots of awesome people doing cool stuff. And like, because that's what I like looking at, right? I don't get a lot of the, yeah, the and, negativity. And, 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 and by the way, and I think it's not that you intentionally chose to use, uh, I believe the poor term looking at, it's what you're trying to live, what mm -hmm. you're aspiring to do, what you mm -hmm. want in your own life. So it's, you know, the idea of looking at something is is shallow in my opinion and and let me explain that in a way that is I, i'm not throwing i'm not throwing you under the bus chance i hope this will make sense in a sec so when you're when you're looking at your social media you're not looking for the it's not the candy gram i mean you're not looking for the candy you're not scrolling to to get you know dopamine 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 i hope that's not how you're doing it, and i believe no. that that's not how you're doing it you're trying to shape your life in a more positive fashion at least that's what i do with social media not Absolutely. just outwardly but also inwardly mm -hmm. but here's the thing uh, at least this is my experience and, and i'm curious as to what you guys think now i've said in the past that i retain some people in my social media feed that suck <laughs> they do yep they're running it completely contrary to a good program, but I use them as yardsticks because they suck and it helps me contextualize what awesome looks like. Yeah. But the people that I don't intentionally keep around because they suck, um, the people that I am not going to use as a yardstick, they'll bounce into my social media feed and in pretty short order, they bounce out because I'm not going to engage in race, religion, politics, or negativity. Mm. And if I have to engage in it because they just won't sum up, because they won't give it up, because they won't shake their heads and wake up, I make it happen. I make them bounce. Mm -hmm. And so I just have zero interest in waking up in the morning and thinking, wow, social media is going to suck today. I wake up in the morning looking forward to whoever I'm going to talk to, whether I talk to someone or not. Mm. I look forward to social media because I've crafted a social media world that is awesome. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. Well, uh, so we've been rolling for just a little bit over an hour here. Uh, 
first off, I want to thank both of you guys, spe- Travis, especially for jumping on here last minute. I yeah, <laughs> buddy. It's like twenty minutes beforehand. I was like, hey, you want what to be took online? you so long? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I want to thank you guys so much. Um, do you guys have any any final thoughts on either understanding your tells, understanding other people's tells, and authenticity, or the mixture of any of those? Any final thoughts before we shut her down? I do have one. Uh, okay, and well, it's in respect to Travis. So um, thanks for joining, of course. And I know that these things uh, happening on a rapid fire basis are dropping right into the mix uh, is sometimes a bit disconcerting for some, but I know that that's not a big deal to you. But uh, I, while we're speaking about authenticity and, and uh, tells, of course, I've been watching everyone. And, uh, and Travis, I love what you're doing. Uh, you hold your space so well. And uh, joining us in on this uh, chat has been awesome. I hope that you've enjoyed it uh, enough that you'll do it again. 100%. I always enjoy chatting with you. And if the invite's open, I'll be there again. Thank you so much. for the Invited. Oh, yeah. The chair is open. <laughs> Just keep the email. This will, <laughs> I'll, make sure uh, uh, I'll make sure that the next one we're, we're going to get you. Uh, we'll give you a little bit more heads up for the next one. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So uh, for uh, myself and Sean and Travis, I can't thank you all enough for joining us. We've had a uh, good crew of people actually sitting there watching. we got a bunch of comments here. I'm just I'm excited for the next one because it's going to be even more awesome. So uh, we'll see you next time here on The Collective. Love Chimo, the boys. Everybody. Chimo.